Hey, hello, Cleveland. Um, welcome to uh, to the new State Library of, uh, of Victoria. I hope you've had an opportunity to uh, to look around. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, one of the exhibits in the uh, in the new um, exhibition here to to accompany the reopening. Uh, Velvet Iron Ashes is the exhibition's name. We're concentrating on the uh, on the sacred soot, uh, the symbol of Anglo-Australian cricket supremacy. Um, the story of the ashes has been retold numberless times, or should I say it's been retold because it basically amounts to the same tale endlessly repeated. But its return to Victoria after 13 decades is an opportunity to see it in the context of its times in the history of this state. Uh, helping me with this task tonight um, are a panel exquisitely balanced in age, gender and cricket prowess. Uh, ranging from a great player to my right to, uh, to me, a miserable, abject failure. Um, but uh, but I was still starting at the other end, uh, we have Jed Smith. Jed Smith has worked, I don't know, how good a cricketer Jed is. Um, well worse than you are, could you? Oh, really? Okay, right. Okay, I'll, I might fight you for that title. Uh, Jed has worked in sports museums for 25 years and now runs museum and heritage services at the Melbourne Cricket Club, including the National Sports Museum. He relocated to Australia in 2007 after managing and curating London's World Rugby Museum. Next to Jed, Alice Clark has been a journalist, producer and presenter for 13 years, specialising in popular culture, including television, technology and video games for The Sunday Herald Sun, The Age and Junkie. She also co-curates the Diversity Lounge at PAX OS, Australia's largest video game convention, a far cry from the world of her great-great-grandmother, Lady Janet Clark, to whom we owe the urn itself. Uh, to my immediate right, Stuart McGill took 208 wickets in 44 test matches. In six Ashes outings, he claimed 39 wickets, including 12 in a match at Sydney, while Shane Warne was busily occupied taking two. But who was, who was counting? Actually, I was. I was there writing for The Guardian. Since retiring from uh, international cricket, Stewart has been a commentator, television host, and now restaurateur at Aristotle's in Neutral Bay. Uh, and in between uh, Alison Stewart, Taylor Vlamink is 21 and bowls fast for the Victorian Spirit and the Hobart Hurricanes, where she also has a running gag with Emily Smith about where they featured in the batting order. Or they did have a running gag until Cricket Australia righteously stepped in. Anyway, she this year made her Ashes debut in the women's test at Taunton, part of a series, Australia One, regaining the distaff version of the urn, which we'll get to. First of all, though, the original. Jed, where does the Ashes rate in the pantheon of sporting trophies? Um, is it the most valuable, or are we being too sentimental? Well, it depends how we define sporting trophy because it either sits very close to the top or nowhere at all, because the definition of sporting trophy would normally be a competition trophy that two sides play for, or more than two sides, a number of sides, and they exchange if they win and they uh, relinquish if they lose. And that is, of course, not the case with the urn. It hasn't been since day one. It's never been that trophy. It's never been a trophy, really. It's a, it's a gift, something quite different. So in terms of sporting trophies and their value and their prestige, it's, it's either very close to the top as a sort of mythical trophy, or it's nowhere at all because it doesn't actually live on that list. So it's a, it's a confusion that's going to come up again and again in this conversation, I guess. Yeah, there are two kinds of ashes, aren't there? There's the physical urn and there's the symbolic uh, custody which, which uh, belongs to the team that, uh, that, that wins the relevant trophy. Um, Alice, how does it loom in the Clark family? How were you inducted in its origin story? Well, I think I remember being about four or five and driving through Sunbury to get somewhere. And my dad said, that's where your great-great-grandma burnt the ashes and started the great cricket uh, competition. And I said, cool, what's cricket? <laughs> so we're very proud of our connection to such a momentous item, but also a just terrible when it comes to caring about sports. <laughs> <laughs> We're a family of nerds. So why did, the why did the Clark family care so much about cricket in 1882 that they would invite the visiting English team out to Rupert's Wood to play a muck-up game 
and go to the trouble of creating uh, an urn from a perfume bottle and fill it with the ashes, perhaps of a bale, perhaps of something else, this as a token stuff. of the um, of of their as a token of endearment. In fact, not sure if it was an endearment so much as just an epic burn. Like uh, Janet, Lady Clark wanted to basically mock them. You lost, we won. Mm -hmm. Here are the ashes of your dead hopes and dreams, mm. which was very on brand for her. Oh, uh, but. Look, it was the 1800s. It was something that Australia could beat England at and did. And it was very exciting. So, yeah, we were going to get involved with cricket. Did would you like to explain the link between the original joke and the, and, and the creation of the, uh, of the urn? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, in August of 1882, um, Australia defeated England at cricket at, at um, the Oval in South London, which was the first defeat England ever suffered on its own territory. Um, and... Within about two days, there was an obituary, uh, a comical obituary in the Sporting Times. In fact, there'd been one in another paper about a day before then, which everyone's forgotten, but the, the, the famous one says, um, you know, in dearly departed English cricket, you've died, we're going to burn your ashes and Australians will take it away. That's wrong, but it's something along those lines. So you have this idea that the England cricket has been destroyed, it's been lost, the hope has been lost, and the Australians are going to take the ashes away with them. Um, then you get, um, the, the key thing here is that kind of joke in the paper normally would have lasted three or four days and then been forgotten, long forgotten. But three weeks after that uh, game, the, the English team then set sail to Australia for the return leg, if you like, the next series. And so the, the commentary was very much alive. The idea of the ashes, the idea of this tragic loss, it was very close to them. And it comes up in um, after dinner speeches between rival captains. It's very much an alive subject. So because of the proximity of the two tours or two games, you can get this um, momentum, this idea of the ashes, that they want to then vie for it, they want to get it back, or they want to defend it. Um, and that's where the, the idea comes, and that's presumably why um, Lady Janet um, creates a set of ashes accordingly. Um, Stuart, cricket is in your blood. Your father and grandfather played first-class cricket. What did they impart to you about the significance of ashes cricket? And where did you get your first exposure to it? Uh, yeah, well, Grandpa's probably the, the main reason I play. Uh, Charlie McGill played either side of the war, opened the batting and bowling. Probably the coolest thing about him, uh, uh, Gideon, is that um, there's a book called Chuckers, uh, and he's in it. So <laughs> it's, it's the cricket equivalent of a convict right. in your family. Yep. So uh, I like that very much. Um, he, uh, he was the tough guy. Mm -hmm. um, and my dad, from all reports, just grew up loving cricket because it wasn't just my grandpa, Charlie, but my great uncle, his brother, um, Mornington McGill. There's got to be something in there. Um, it's, it's all a tie back to the booze, the wine, I think. Mornington Peninsula, thank you. Um, <clears throat> but I, uh, it, it was a cricketing family. And the reason they liked cricket is, growing up in the, uh, the, the Depression, they said that it was a cruel game. And... The cruelty of cricket. So if you're a batsman, you miss out. If you make a mistake, you're out. You don't get a hit uh, and, until the next time you're lucky enough to be given the bat. Uh, and bowlers can be humiliated. Um, and it's all about how you sort of wake up the next day or get up the next ball and do it. And that's what was sort of drummed into me from a very early age. And, and my dad respected the game accordingly. I think the reason that the Ashes and... Uh, you know the the not the the aura around this particular competition is so great is because it goes back to that it's about beating people that don't have any respect for you um and that's that that's you know i guess the the colonial uh, outposts used to like to do that and um let me just say well they still when you go and it's a silly thing to do because, um, you know, I don't have any convicts in my family yet. <laughs> my kids are going to, but we'll get, a, we'll get to that later. Um, but they still call us convicts, so it's still a thing. And I love beating people that, uh, you know, choose to sneer at you. In, in the Australian teams of your era, who held it throughout that time, what did it mean? I mean, you played under Steve Waugh, who was perhaps the most demonstrative of all Australian captains about tradition and sentiment. 
embodied in his kind of rediscovery of the of the baggy green cap. How did the ashes fit into that particular firmament? Well, look, Steve's probably been misrepresented to a certain degree because they people said that he sledged the most and he was, mm. you know, mm. but he really didn't, uh, you know, and I, I can give you a number of examples, you know, particularly uh, against other countries that prove that he was mm. the one that sort of told us to pull back and, and, and be a little bit more respectful. Um, he was worried once about a very prominent West Indian player because he thought he was going to have a breakdown and wouldn't let me at him, which was a shame because I just wanted to see if you could make somebody have a breakdown in sport. Um, I'm a little bit unusual, so just, you know, bear with me. But, but Steve was the best for me because he realised that in this room of 100 people, there would be 100 different ways of getting from point A to point B. And what we should do as sportsmen and women was respect that route uh, and uh, uh, trust that we all had the same goal. And Stephen was my favourite captain. I, I, I liked it a lot. And still to this day, because we don't have anything in common, uh, totally different backgrounds, totally different, um, you know, viewpoint on life. But if I called him now and said I was in trouble, he'd come and help me. Interestingly, when, the, uh, when it was announced that the urn was coming out to Australia, we invited Steve down uh, for, the, for, the, um, for the announcement at the, at the State Library of Victoria. And it was clear that he was still very emotionally connected to the idea of Anglo-Australian cricket uh, when, when he won so many other honours and, you know, and led Australia, um, figuratively at least, in 1995 when they become basically the world's number one test nation. But it did seem to me as though he still measured Australian accomplishment by where it stood in relation to England. I think it's to do with um, the respect that England has and and will always have, I, I suspect, uh, of um, Test cricket. So um, for Steve, it is all about that battle over five days, yes. four or five days, and and what that means and the respect component mm -hmm. of it. Whereas maybe you know, sporting uh, cricketing nations on the rise don't necessarily feel the same. Don't, they don't feel the same. No, no, they don't. Well, they don't have they don't have 140 years of history bearing down on them either. Yeah. yeah. Taylor, as I said, there are women's ashes. They're almost exactly the same age as you. Uh, <laughs> they were created in uh, July 1998, and you were created three months later. Um, what do you know about them, and can you explain how Australia's rivalry with England? Uh, in women's cricket, mirrors and differs from the male version? Yeah, I think for me personally growing up, um, I was just loved every sport I could I could think of. And for me, Boxing Day, um, all I could think of, I suppose, I relate is the Ashes and, and watching Australia play England and then going out to play backyard cricket in the middle. So I think um, from a men's cricket perspective, there's that. And I think a lot of the, the girls in the team now grew up watching that. So you kind of... Um, have that ingrained in you, I suppose, in a way of how competitive those series are. Um, and then more recently, obviously, um, in the women's game, um, it's only just starting to, to now reach at the heights it's, it's going to reach. But I think Australia and England have definitely led the way in that, in that race in, in getting the professionalism of our sport and of women's cricket going. So I think there's also the fact that Australia and England are probably the two top teams in mm. female cricket at the moment. So that makes the Ashes also a very competitive series um, and one that is really cool to be a part of. It's a very handsome trophy um, that uh, that's now used. It's interesting, I was reading that for a long time the women's game actually scorned trophies. The original Women's Cricket Association constitution in England in 1930 proclaimed that no member of any affiliated club shall take part in any cricket challenge cup or prize competition. The idea that you left that kind of nasty competitive stuff to the men. <laughs> Do, can, can, you, can you talk us through how the, how the, the women's ashes was created, where they, they apparently they burned a, an autographed bat in a wok in the, <laughs> Harris, in the Harris Garden at Lord's in July 1998? I can guarantee that I have no idea how they created the ashes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, but well, no, what I do know now is that um, the system that we've got mm. in place is, is really cool and I think it allows – it's quite different to the men's in the mm. fact that we play one test match every two years, yeah. um, which is quite different in the fact that I suppose when that test match comes around, um, it's interesting um, around training and around the group and that kind of thing 
just how competitive everyone gets because mm. it's that one opportunity that you kind of grow up watching test cricket. So it's mm. your, your one chance in two years to to get a game. And cricket and sport obviously is such a, a fickle thing and who knows what's going to happen in mm. two years. So when that test match mm. comes around, mm. um, yeah, everything gets a little bit more fire in the nets and, and everyone wants to show what they've got. So um, we obviously then play um, a bit of a different um, series and that we also have three T20 matches and three ODIs yes. to constitute how the, the point, How does the point system work, Taylor? Um, so there's, there's three um, ODI games to start off, which are all worth three points. Uh, sorry, two points. Um, and then we have a test match in the middle, uh, which is worth four points. Then you play three two twenties at the end, worth two. Mm-hmm. So then it's kind of yeah, an accumulation of, of your points um, towards the end. But mm. um, yeah, the test match kind of takes the centre stage, and, mm. and everyone really wants that baggy green. Mm. Jed, let's go to the trophy itself, to the artifact itself. What do we know about what it actually is, um, and what it's composed of? Uh, very little. Oh, uh, mm. My colleague to my left might. Uh, have more information than I do. I mean, we, we don't get near it. I mean, it's not the kind of thing you can go and sort of examine mm. easily or carefully. It's um, under lock at Keir Lords and has been since 1929, I think, um, in their museum, at the pavilion at Lords. It's been over here three times, most recently 2006, but otherwise it's locked away. Um, it doesn't get taken out, doesn't get looked after, apart from cleaning and careful restoration. So I've never been close to it. It's, you know, it's... I was thinking before coming here this evening about the trophy, and I thought, I really would like to just hold it. And it's, it's not something that I have to worry about, because I get to hold a lot of amazing sporting objects as part of my job. But I don't get the urge to put them on my head or wear them. I don't sort of go, there's a baggy green, I really want to... It's not the kind of thing you feel, but the urn, because you can't get close to it, it has its aura, right. which is totally ridiculous, because, again, going back to the point that it, it isn't associated with any of these games or any of these players. Steve Waugh never picked up the urn. He picked up a urn, the Waterford Crystal urn, various other urns that over hundreds of years have been used. But that urn has got something about it. It's kind of magical. What's it it made from? Well, apparently it's a perfume Mm. bottle, um, which suggests that it's a mass-produced object. Yes, yes. So if if you're looking, getting a bit deep, sorry for a moment, Mm, if if you look at the, um, the ways that museums value objects or create value systems... There's a, the paradigm is these kind of eight value structures that you <coughs> assign to an object. It can be valuable based on scarcity, on its materials it's made from, its associations, um, its age, um, whether craftsmanship was employed or whether it's mass produced. The ashy zone fails on all of them. Mm. It's not mm. that old. Yes. It's not beautifully crafted. It's not from precious materials. It's not associated with, it's not like the black and ball, the ball that was mm, pocketed yeah, when the 1882 yeah. no, exactly. yeah. game was yes. won. That, that was there. Yeah. The Ashes Inn was nowhere near there. It wasn't even associated with cricket. So it's, it doesn't hit anything, any mm. of those standards or measures. Mm. So when it comes to valuing it, I mean, in, in terms of insurance value, um, you, you, I wouldn't know where to start. I don't know mm. how, mm. It's, it's entirely possible that Lords have taken the approach that most art galleries take, which is that, you can't replace something so amazing, so mm. unique, mm. one-off, so you don't insure it. You mm. save on the multi, mm. multi-million dollar premium each year, and you invest a portion of that on security, or not taking it anywhere, or restoration. Mm. And it's entirely possible it's not insured, because mm. I don't know how you'd arrive at a mm. number that would actually be worth um, the premium. The, the other aspect of the, um, of the uh, Ashes Urn, which, which perhaps is left out of account, often is that it was a more risque joke here in Australia than it was in the Sporting Times, that the inspiration that Reginald Shirley Brooks had in placing the obituary in the Sporting Times in the first place was that cremation would shortly become legal in England after a decade-long campaign. And I think Brooks's father had been a leading light in the, in the cremation um, movement. Um, it would actually be another 42 years before Australia got its first crematorium so it's actually quite a spicy little little joke from from Lady <laughs> Janet. A- a- Alice, I take it that Lady Janet approved of cremation only under certain limited circumstances. Was was she cremated herself? I think she her she had the state funeral. Her body was yeah. paraded around. People cried in the streets, mm. which I think is what we all hope for, really. <laughs> um, she was this beloved figure in mm. Melbourne. What can you tell us about her? Uh, she was one of the original feminists, despite never vocally supporting women's suffrage. Mm. Uh, she, uh, so as a child, 
her dad died at 16 and didn't leave any money to the girls. So she had to become a governess. And she was actually the governess for William Clark's first wife, mm. who then died. And mm. so William Clark, 20 years older than her, said, hey, do you want to be my mistress now? And she said, you got to put a ring on it first. And so he did. And mm. then a year later, an uncle mm. died, uh, an uncle of his died, and they became incredibly wealthy. And he said, let's travel the world. And she said, okay, but only if I can give money away. And he, mm. he was like, sure, I don't care. Mm. So she gave a lot of money to help sustain the women's hospital, uh, the children's hospital. Mm. She opened a uh, lodging for women to go to Melbourne University, which women hadn't really been able to do before. Mm. Mm. Uh, she was amazing. Mm. And it was at one point, I think it was in the early 1900s, considered the second most influential person, not mm. woman, person mm. in Victoria. Yes. Which is pretty incredible for that time. Um, but she also had a wicked sense of humour. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, this seems to fit with that. Mm. Stuart, you're the renaissance man of, of cricket. What was your knowledge of the trophy's <laughs> backstory? <clears throat> well, look, as I alluded to before, I kind of like uh, rubbing people's faces in it if they don't respect you. Having said that, if they do respect mm. you, it's, um, it's a polite handshake mm. at the end of the game. But... You know, um, and I, I thought that it, it was it was quite hilarious, and mm. I and I thought it was I didn't know a lot about the family. I apologise, mm. Alice. That's okay. Um, but but um, I, I did think it was it was kind of cool that it was uh, a well-to-do family mm. that yeah. uh, yeah, because I would imagine in those times, and I'm only guessing, um, uh, I'd imagine that the wealthy in the UK. Mm. No matter how generous or progressive mm. or wealthy their uh, you know their relatives were in Australia, did, did still scorn them as mm. being mm. inferior mm. in some way, shape, or form. And that, to me, is is it makes this joke or this you know symbolic gesture even better. Mm. And uh, yeah. and and I think it's very suitable uh, that the uh, you know the the representation of our uh, sporting competition mm. is wrapped up in this. Yeah. Uh, little perfume bottle. It's also a love token, of course, because um, Lady Janet's music teacher or, or companion, yeah, Florence Morphy, ended up marrying Ivo Bly, the captain of the England cricket team, and mm -hmm. becoming Lady Darnley in, uh, in, in due course. Uh, she was another um, upwardly mobile woman from, mm -hmm. the, from the colonies. Um, her family's uh, the father died young, magistrate father, Left the family in Beechworth, stricken by by poverty, and you can sort you can sort of imagine Lady Janet and Florence chortling away at their cleverness <laughs> about uh, coming up with this ashes urn for this for this oh, muck certainly. up game. And then we the the family likes to uh, conspiracy theory. We have no proof of this, but that when Janet got her and Florence to present the urn, that part of it was slightly to set her and Ivo up. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. There's no evidence, but yeah. the family likes to believe it. I reckon so. It. I, re it's very th I reckon there's quite strong evidence of that. He falls in love very quickly, doesn't oh, yeah. he? <laughs> he, um, he sends this fantastic letter home to his father, Lord Darnley, asking for permission to marry Florence. Mm. And it just goes on for pages and pages and pages about Florence's virtues. And at the end, he puts, oh, by the way, we lost the first test. <laughs> <laughs> right, six wickets. Uh, sorry about that. But, uh, but on the more important things. And, it, of course, the letter takes three months to make its way across the world and then it takes three months for the answer to come back. And the answer is uh, no, <laughs> no. But then eventually Ivo goes back to England and makes his petitions, makes a personal petition and, uh, and obtains um, the... Uh, father's permission and eventually they do become Lord and Lady Darnley on the uh, on the on the estate in Kent and it's as a result of um, well, really it was more or less Florence you know sort of keeping that um, keeping that trophy and keeping it prominent in the family and eventually donating it to Lords that allows it to uh, to come into the custody of the of the Mullabin Cricket Club. Matchmaker.com version one. Yeah exactly yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Janet was just good at stuff I think <laughs> is the way to yeah. Taylor, you were presented earlier this year with your baggy green at Taunton by uh, by Mitchell Stark, um, uh, Mr. Mr. Healy. Um, 
What did it mean to you to join that lineage of players, male and female, that have represented Australia against England? Yeah, I can pretty safely say that was probably one of the best days of my life, getting that test cap. Um, it's just, it was an awesome day. And I remember um, Elisa Healy um, came up to me just before the start of the, the toss and I was like pacing around the boundary line like a nervous wreck. I had no idea um, how to go about it. And she came up to me and she said, I can guarantee you right now you're not the most nervous person at the ground. And I'm thinking I'd love to meet them because they must be <laughs> something else. Um, and then Mitch walked out um, with the test cap Um and it was a really cool presentation. I don't remember a lot of it. I had to go back and watch the video because at the time I was right. kind of just <laughs> so worked up about it all. But he did um, present me as my as my test number for both the women's mm. team and my overall test number for just uh, as a cricketer, I suppose, which right. I thought was really cool as well. Um, and it was just an awesome day. So, so you get two numbers, do you? You get a, a female number and a, an overall number. Well, he – not specifically, but right. he went to the effort to, to oh, figure really? it out. Yeah, so right. – So he added number. up the two numbers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's ma- Bit he's of a ma- stretch from Mitchell there. <laughs> You'll be getting an earn yeah, off him. His Apple iPhone did the math for him and, um, yeah. No, Maybe Alyssa really did cool. it for him. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. How does, the, um, how does the female baggy green differ from the male baggy green, if, if at all? The coat of arms is just a slightly different – Sort is of it right? thing. It's the same as our test shirts. I'm actually not sure um, right. what the reason behind that is, but it's just a slightly different kind of colour um, than the men's. I'm not sure why, and I'm not sure because of course it's how not long that'll be. But it's not the official Australian coat of arms. It's a pre-federation coat of arms, which has became sort of obsolete in any other context, but lives on in the uh, on the Australian baggy green. Uh, Jed, the the State Library has brought the ashes to Australia in a different context, as an artefact in the in the history, the social history of, uh, of Victoria. I'm interested in why that doesn't happen more often. Why, for so long, sports history has been a bit of a silo that sport tends to treat itself as a kind of a self-contained world. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Mm. Um, it's a statement and a question. I mean, it's. Mm. It works both ways. Mm. Um, most art galleries, most museums don't welcome the subject. They don't see the value in it. Um, they don't see the opportunity that it presents to see things differently through a prism that normally they don't use. Um, but equally, uh, you, you may say, sweeping statement time, that may, many people who are obsessed with sports wouldn't necessarily cross the threshold into a museum or art gallery. Now, that is a sweeping statement, and everyone here might say, that's rubbish, I don't agree. That's fine, but just taking the sort of sweeping statement approach. Um, the two have taken a long time to come together, yes. and both have had to make concessions. Um, and sports museums find ourselves neatly tucked in the middle trying to kind of bring the two together. Um, so we engage with the sports lever, and we try and present something deeper than just batting averages and um, numbers of flags a team has won. We give mm. them something around social history. So the Ashes story is a beautiful example of that, and a lot of the stuff that... We're just touching, touching the tip of the iceberg here. This is an amazing story which involves so much about two nations and their own histories. Um, so sports museums are trying to pull that side in, across to the, to the sporting public, but we're also trying to engage with the, the institutions who don't usually talk about sport. We try and lend objects. We try and engage in um, shared exhibitions, loans. Um, but it's a difficult sell. And oftentimes, somebody working in a sports museum will go to a museum's conference and feel like the odd man out. They won't be really um, given the same kudos. It still happens, despite 30 years or more of professional sports museum, um, museology and practice. I mean, even in Australia, which you would regard as a sort of a sports-obsessed country, the idea that professional historians would include sports in their narratives is only a very recent development. You know, Manning Clark was a famous Carlton football club obsessive and used to bind his books in blue and white, but he never incorporated the fortunes of the Carlton football club in his histories. Well, Geoffrey Searle was a, was a Hawthorne fan and he used to bind his books in, in gold and yellow, but you won't find any trace of the Hawthorne football club in anything Geoffrey Searle wrote. That was Sport was something that you did at the weekend, wasn't it? There was, that was recreation, that was downtime, that wasn't yeah. something serious. Yeah, it was turning your brain off mm. to allow it to recharge. Mm. Um, whereas... Sport is everywhere. It's, even if you hate sport, that in itself is an action. Yes. That's, a, that's a decision that you've made based on something. It informs, it explains you. 
somehow, mm. um, the position you've taken. Um, and that says a lot about you and what your, your thoughts and behaviours mm. are, and that's worth examining. And Australia's right for that, yes. because it's everywhere, it's omnipresent, in a way that it really isn't in most other countries. Mm. Mm. Uh, Alice, you're in the world of games as yeah. distinct from the world of sports, but the world of games does emulate the world of sports in offering copious virtual trophies as you complete levels mm. and stages in, in games. And yet I've read that the completion rate for games is actually quite low. People are actually getting yes. through to the end point of a game. So what role do trophies serve in the kind of games that you write about? It really does depend on the game and the genre. In an open world game where there might not necessarily be an end point, the achievements or PlayStation trophies give you something to do, something to work towards. Mm. When there's really like go out, build a house, if you like. Uh, in The Sims, there's no end, but you can earn achievements if you have 100 babies. Now, most people aren't <laughs> going to finish the game because that's a lot of babies. <laughs> but I find the way uh, video games most emulate real-world sports is in eSports. Mm. You have mm. very highly paid athletes. Uh, they win trophies, significant amounts of mm. money, and there are fans wearing their jerseys everywhere. Yes. Video games, a world which once used to shun real sports, sure does seem to be emulating them a lot. Yes. Yes, it's yeah. a universal sort of aspiration, is it, to hold a trophy over your head and flourish it wildly and spray champagne mm. everywhere. Everyone wants to win and be very rich. They do, they do. What part do trophies and mementos play in the aftermath of one's sporting career, Stuart? What about your own trophies? Oh, I was I watching sold all of them. I was watching your <laughs> um, I was watching your twelve at the uh, at the SCG the other day, and I saw you yank a stump out mm. from the end at the non-strikers end after taking the last wicket. W where is it now, and what does it mean to you? Uh, look, okay, so one of the reasons that I play cricket. Uh, is uh, quite apart from my family, be because my dad, my dad played, he was very, very good friends with Dennis Lilly. And every time I went to Dennis's house as a little boy, we're talking from three, two, three, four, five years old, when we left, because in those days there was no babysitters, we couldn't afford babysitters, so you'd sleep on the floor at, at, at your friend's house. And um, he would give me a present when I left, and it would be a stump or a pair of gloves or a photo or a ball that meant something to him. And I was always told that you don't give presents away if they don't mean anything to you. So I think that's, a, I think that's quite good because otherwise it's just, it doesn't mean mm. anything. So, mm. um, so I have given a lot away. Right. I've given, I've sold some uh, because uh, life after professional sport can sometimes be reasonably interesting. That's okay. Um, but... My family still requires right. some things to, right. so that I can remind them that I'm not just the grumpy old guy sleeping on the couch. <laughs> um, and that particular stump uh, and my boots and the two balls from that right. game are in the museum at the SCG. Right. And I put them in, and my baggy green from that game yeah, as right, well. Right. Uh, they're in there so that I can't, so that I can't sell them. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it'd be a good idea. Look, they're still us. Um, yeah. They're on loan, but I thought, yeah. look, at least I've got something that's cool, and it's there, and it's being looked after a lot better than being in the bottom drawer. Yeah. I've still got a bunch of shirts that are yeah, signed right. and stuff like that, but we don't ever look at them. So, because I'm not one of these guys that uh, I don't have a pool room and I don't have a bar, you know what. <laughs> I'd much rather go to a bar somewhere else, uh, but then you know my stinky old joint. But uh, but the thing is, I, I think with memories, it's about the people anyway. Um, yeah. And I don't catch up with guys all that often, but when you do, it is really quite nice. Mm. Um, I actually feel the the way <laughs> the way you felt, Taylor, when when you got presented your cap and you didn't really know what to do. I remember that every time I see guys that were in the team on the day when I got given my cap. And that's way more than even the cap, probably. Um, if I see those guys and I remember that they were looking at me when I was awkward, 
and worried. Uh, that's the feeling that I want because it makes me feel special. Taylor, what's, what's a personal token of your career that you're personally very strongly attached to? Oh, apart from the baggy green that yeah. has its own mental piece next to my bed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's interesting. I sort of agree um, in the sense that um, I was a part of the, the World Cup team. We got a medal for that. There's a, we got a medal for the Ashes, that kind of thing. And that's just kind of tucked in my bottom drawer next to my bed. But I, And if I look at it, I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Like, we won a World Cup. But that's not what I remember of the World Cup. The thing I remember the most was probably sitting around having a drink with the girls on the pitch after the game and the photos taken from that. No, more so than the actual piece of silverware, I suppose, to say we won the World Cup. Um, but, yeah, I think the shirts and stuff like that probably mean more to me um, than the actual medals themselves, if that makes sense. But, yeah, the baggy grain's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, back to the Ashes. It's almost 140 years old. Why has it not died out? Each of you, it's a spur-of-the-moment joke trophy inaugurated on a country estate inspired by an issue, cremation, which is, we've long forgotten there was any debate about. I mean, Lady Janet surely would piss herself laughing that here we are speaking of it in terms so earnest. So what accounts for its longevity? Jed? I think it's about disengaging the physical object and the, the name again. I think that without... Lady Janet's the Darnley Urn. I, I, the Ashes story would have continued. There would have been other Ashes trophies. I think that we've counted about 12 that were awarded as the Ashes because the Darnley Urn went, dis disappeared. It went into the family. They disappeared. They, it was not available for anyone to see. It wasn't known about. It was a private oh, gift. Oh. Um, it wasn't until the 1920s when it was gifted yeah. to Lords that it yeah. was seen by anyone else. Yes. So by then, the Ashes as an idea was well established. Um, the name... Rugby League had already copied it for their own uh, Great Britain Australian se series. Um, there were, as I say, many other Ashes urns already produced. Mm. Cartoons of the Ashes accompanied every tour. Um, and they don't look anything like yeah, the, they're the like Ashes just tin cans or uh, funeral yeah. urns. A very, you know, it's a thousand different images yes. um, and a dozen different trophies, which were awarded to different captains who won mm. that season. Mm. So, you know, um, Laver got his own Ashes trophy. Yes. Um, as did others. It was a, a, similar, a familiar thing. What happens next is quite peculiar. It comes, up, it comes to Lords. Um, it's gifted. It goes into the long room originally, not the yes. museum. And for some reason, it becomes the image. Yes. That particular yes. Now, because it came, comes back to 1883 and 1882 when those participants, mm. the Billy Murdoch era, yes. it's obviously from that. It's not from the 1930s or 40s. It's from the origin. So it becomes the image, the, the symbol yes. of the theoretical ashes, and the two things come together. Um, but it's first, not, the first it's not Australian team to see it is 1930, isn't it? Lady Darnley gives yeah. a talk to, yeah. the, to the visiting team that includes yeah. Bradman yeah. and explains the, the, the back story to it. And I think at the end of that tour, the Australian manager, Kelly, says, oh, so does that mean that we get to take it with us? Yeah. And Lords goes, uh, <laughs> uh, no, sorry about that. <laughs> and people have been saying that ever since, um, mm. including Richard Branson mm. in 2006. Yes, you remember that, when you were there, Gideon, I at the do. press I conference. Was there. Yeah. yeah, there's been many attempts to remove it from Lords, mm. where it's not a sporting trophy. We go back to the first mm. statement, it's, it's a symbol. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the, the name of the Ashes will have lived on without it, mm. but the two coming together. I mean, yes. I've got a pin badge from 1991 with the urn on the Darnley urn, the Ashes, 1991. And there's no reason that that image is on there, no, but it is. And, no, and no. it's now it absolutely cemented together. Mm. Alice, what does it mean to you to have this sort of personal connection to something so antique and venerable? It's... I actually don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's this... It, there's a warm sense of family pride, but it's gone beyond. It's just mm. a symbol of Australia versus England and that Australia can and frequently does beat England, and that England is such a sore loser, they hold on to that urn yes. and will not <laughs> let it go. It more means that than anything. But it is nice to see the birthplace of the Ashes sign outside mm. Rupert's Wood or Salesian yes. College as it is yep. now, every now and then. But Tell you play Ashes test matches so seldom. Is there... 
any danger that that tradition will peter out, do you think? I mean, every, uh, every Ashes test that the women play just seems like it could almost be the last. You always want more, but you never seem, there's never seems any sign of you getting them. What would it mean if there were no more Ashes test matches for women to play? Yeah, I think it's a hard one because I think everyone is really eager and, and quick to judge the standard of our test match, which mm. I think is quite harsh considering we get probably three training sessions in the lead up to it to yeah, actually yeah, train yeah, with the red ball. Yeah. Before that, those three sessions, I'd never bowl with a red ball in my life. Yeah, so right. you're then expected right? to go out and, and perform for four days and, and make a, a spectacle of it so the public um, – appreciates it and wants more mm. which i think is hard but i think for us as a team um we'd love to play more tests like mm. i think that those training sessions and, and those four days were were such a cool four days of cricket and i think it's just a fine line between obviously trying to promote the women's game um t20 and one day cricket is is better at doing that and it showcases mm. our skills probably a little bit more and the public are more keen to watch that kind of stuff so mm. It's hard because I think if you ask any of the girls in the team um, what part of the t that Ashes tour in England they enjoyed the most, it definitely would have been sitting in the change rooms, mm. you know, whites and baggy green. Mm. Um, mm. But then I suppose when you ask the public, it would be the opposite. So, yeah, um, yeah I think it's a hard one. And, and I think we all obviously really want to play more test cricket. It's just whether we can continue it. Because I think to have that tradition die in the women's game would mm. be pretty sad. But I think the other part of it as well is that at the moment it's only Australia and England that play test matches, yes. which makes it hard when there's only two teams you can kind of schedule a game against. Yeah. So I think that's the other part of it. If we can get more nations involved, um, that'll hopefully keep that, the test match mm. aspect alive, which will then continue into the Ashes. Mm. Stuart, how do you regard the Ashes cricket that you played now? You, when, you were, when you were caught up in the effort of, of playing for Australia, um, it was almost too sudden and too dramatic and too emotional an experience for you to get any distance on. But how do you how do you regard those test matches in your career now as you look back on them? Part of the uh, respect component of cricket, uh, particularly I guess growing up in a family like mm. mine that was, that was a cricketing family, was about the history and traditions of the game. And whether we like it or not, um, that makes up a huge part of what cricket actually is. And so the big names in through history have participated in nationalist competitions. And, and I think that uh, you, it, the, the love-hate relationship that you have, you know, as an Australian uh, playing against England or watching England as a spectator, because I, I, you know, I watched as a spectator for a lot longer than I played, um, uh, you know, um, I think that really does lend to the significance you place on this particular uh, urn, um, which, you know, as we've said, is a representation of that competition. But I think that the one thing that I've learned tonight is, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, that at the very origin point, that it may well have been a symbol of, uh, of love. And as we know, Gideon, love endures, my friend. Love, love and cremation. <laughs> what a combination. Now, um, great opportunity to, uh, to question our expert panel here this evening. Does anyone have anything that they'd like to, to ask any of our speakers, Jed, Alice, Taylor or Stuart? Gideon, first of all, thanks for a great presentation. Now, correctly you mentioned um, Manning Clark and Geoffrey Searle. Mm. I think you neglected to in, um, mention the exceptions to the rule. Geoffrey Blaney wrote a great True, publication. Yes, yes. And like Alice, Martin Flanagan, great social commentator mm. and historian, mm. um, chronicled the life and times of Tom Wills yes. in The Call and other publications. So um, what do you have to say about that, Gideon? <laughs> Well, Martin's not a historian. Martin would never lay claim to being a historian, but The Call, of course, is a, is a novelised version of, uh, of, of Wills' life. And I'm not sure that you'd find too much about sport in Geoffrey's general histories. He certainly wrote the definitive account of the, of the origins of Australian rules football, and he is, like myself, a fanatical Geelong, fo Geelong Football Club supporter. But, um, but I think... Uh, I'd, I'd stand by that comment. I think that... Um, uh, 
historians have had a little bit of trouble letting their hair down sufficiently to incorporate aspects of popular culture more generally into, uh, into narratives. We, we have a tradition of sort of top-down history, history written about the powerful, um, which is strange, strangely at odds with our allegedly egalitarian culture. But perhaps that's because we needed to go through the process of creating a history that looked like other countries' history before we could perhaps come up with a, a, a version that looks more authentically our own. Anybody else? Yes. I've always thought it was, it's really interesting that, um, I'll call it soccer, so everyone knows. The countries where soccer is not popular, they're pretty well all countries that play cricket. Um, and well, rugby, don't say that to an A-League supporter. And, <laughs> and, rug, and, ru and rugby union. You think of all the countries. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's just, just thought it was quite interesting. There isn't really any country outside England that, that love that cricket and, and, and yeah. soccer are yeah. uh, the top, top two sports. The, mm. Do we have 20 minutes for a quick answer? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the quickest answer I can. Yeah. It, not that you're asking the question, I'm sorry, if, if I can sort of spread a bit of light on that. Um, most of the sports created or codified in the 19th century in the UK, which mm. is most sports, with the exception of the American sports and a few uh, modern sports, um, were based on an imperial remit. It was about uh, training children, boys exclusively, to be strong mentally and physically. It was called muscular Christianity. It was at the heart of all these sporting endeavours, it was at the heart of the schooling, the education system, it was at the heart of empire. Grow strong, healthy-minded children who will go out and become administrators, um, sailors, soldiers, traders, to run the empire, to expand the empire, to protect the empire. <clears throat> the, the sports that were created as part of that ethos went out into the empire. Rugby football was central, cricket was central. Um, soccer refused to play that game. It amended its rules to become less martial, less aggressive. It moved away from that sense of um, empire building. And as a consequence, it didn't go out to the empire. So the Commonwealth countries tend to play cricket, rugby football. The other nations who play soccer tended to find it through other means, but not through the British Empire. I, I wondered what, if anything's known of the origin of the bag. Oh, that's, a, that's a very good because question. Because if the bottle is mass produced, yes. did the yes. bag come with it? The years embroidered on it, which seems to say no. Um, but they're colour coordinated. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Jed, do you want to do you want to comment on that? All I know is yeah. that the, the bag came later. Yes. The, the gift of the urn was presented, and then the, ga the bag was made some time after, perhaps a year later. Yeah, it was a woman from Sydney, wasn't it? Um, and in fact, yeah. strangely yeah. enough, you've reminded me, her descendants have recently contacted me, and I'm going to see them in, uh, in Sydney, because it's a story that I don't know very much about either. Um, obviously, she read that the urn had been created, and she thought, well as a nice gesture, I'll create a bag for it to be incorporated in, but it is something that's, um, that's often left out of account, yeah. It's uh, Anne Fletcher. She was the... Yes, Anne Fletcher, yeah, yeah. yeah she was, Thank you. She was the wife of um, a cricket... Um, I think he was a captain of the New South Wales cricket team. Yes. Um, Thanks, this is Carolyn Fraser, who's the curator of the Velvet Iron Ashes exhibition. Hello, Carolyn. <laughs> and the only Hello. one who managed to get the ashes out of England. Um, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thank you. And uh, it was made um, uh, just uh, a couple of months after mm. the original presentation. And yes. the, uh, the supposition is that there was a second presentation. So when it was first presented, right. it was presented with the idea that if the English team did win the yes, upcoming series, yes. they would get to take it home. Yeah. But it was contingent on them winning those matches. Yes. And so in the interim period, um, uh, Anne Fletcher made the bag. Um, it's embroidered on both sides, mm -hmm. and so, but by uh, different people. Um, yes. And so the, uh, the side that we have on display in the exhibition um, has the date, 1883. Yes. On the reverse side are Ivo Bly's initials um, that were done at a much later date. Right. Um, 
and um, the idea is that uh, the team were invited back to Rupert's Wood at Easter in 1883, yes. and uh, in the interim period, it was when the little uh, the verse from Punch was cut out yes, right. and was adhered to the urn, and uh, what uh, what is believed to have happened was that the the second presentation was after their victory, and that was when the bag was also presented. Yes, yes. It's terrible verse, by the way. The worst kind of Victorian doggerel doesn't even scan, barely rhymes. Um, but uh, but can't complain about these things. They're uh, they're they're set in stone. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to meeting that um, the, that descendant of Mrs. Fletcher's. Uh, because it, um, it's, a, it's a part of the story that doesn't often get, get, get written. Of course, the other curiosity about the First Ashes series is, of course, that it was actually drawn to all on the, on the scoreline, but according to Ivo Bly, he basically said, well, we only ever agreed to play three test matches in the first place, so we won the Ashes 2-1, and the last match doesn't count. Perfidious, perfidious Albion. I think, uh, I think redrawing I, the uh, the. Uh, I'm going to actually contradict you there, Gideon. Mm. I, d I never thought I'd do this. Certainly not yeah. in public. Um, sure. <laughs> um, Ivo Bly um, maintains that the the fourth match should count, and he therefore refused. Oh, and he said that the, they should leave the ashes behind; that it should be buried in the street. Should be buried at the he? MCG. Yeah. He, yes. It's a dinner at the MCG, a farewell dinner. He yes, said I shouldn't be blaming. The ashes Ivo should be Bly buried here somewhere. Yeah. And give it to the groundsmen yes. to go and bury somewhere yes. secretly. Yes. <laughs> this is being recorded, I can't comment. <laughs> Stuart, did you ever get a hat trick? Uh, not in an Ashes series. Well, I did. Oh, but not in, in an Ashes, ashes series? No, not in an Ashes series. Oh, there we go. Mine no. was against New Zealand, but let's not quibble. Stuart, you said that uh, you respected Steve Waugh. If he told you to bowl underarm, would you? Yes or no? A uh, very, very easy answer, actually. Steve Waugh would never ask me to bowl under arm. <laughs> and he certainly wouldn't have asked you to use sandpaper, I dare say. No, he wouldn't no. have asked me. He wouldn't have had no. to ask me. <laughs> yeah. A uh, great speech. Thank you. It's been very enlightening. Now, as cricket is competing against lots of other sports now, do you think there's an option for creating another Ashes, either with a, an India or a New Zealand or something of the same significance, or is it only ever going to be the Ashes in cricket, as in one-on-one -on -one or teams playing for, not necessarily the Ashes, but something of equal substance that's well, not the World Cup? In some ways, that, that rivalry exists in India versus Pakistan, and if anything, it's perhaps even more radioactive than the uh, than than the ashes unfortunately it's so politically contentious that the teams can't meet on a bilateral basis and haven't been able to play a test match since 2007 they still compete they still get drawn against each other in icc events but they have not been able to meet on a test match field since then which is a which is a great tragedy actually because in some ways it's exactly what test match cricket needs it needs that that dynamic, that particular drama that comes from two countries that have a deep and abiding and somewhat tense relationship for them to play out their differences on a, on a sporting field. But unfortunately, we seem no closer to that coming about than we were five or six years ago. The, the, the trophy that we play for uh, against the West Indies um, and the trophy that we play for uh, when we play against India, they're significant trophies. But I feel that, and possibly the reason that we're all sitting here tonight, is that it's, it's the long-standing respect for tradition and enduring uh, tradition between Australia and England that has elevated this particular, um, you know, talisman icon um, representation of that competition to where it is. Because you could argue that, you know, the West Indies uh, versus Australia in the 80s would have been a pretty significant competition. Um, but subsequent to that, there's been a few undulations in, uh, in form and, and commitment to the game, I might add. Um, and in India, it's only since Virat Kohli has taken over that their 
their love of test cricket has been reborn. And so that's probably why that particular trophy has not been, um, you know, so iconic. So I, I think it's... It, look, if you went into a, a, a village pub uh, anywhere in England on any given day and asked anybody in there what cricket meant to them, um, you would sense the respect that they had for years gone by. Um, and I think that's why this is a standalone at this point in time. Who knows, it might change. Um, uh, but I think that that's probably the answer to your question. That Administrators have tried to create the same feel, but you can't, you can't manufacture, um, you know, decades, <coughs> hundreds of years of, of respect. And the other thing is that the Ashes works economically. And frankly, that's you know, where the rubber hits the road these days. There was some talk in the 1990s and early 2000s that Australia's supremacy was so abiding and so profound that really it was um, time to stage the Ashes over three test matches or even two test matches. You know, that we were merely playing for, for, for sentimental reasons. And in fact, it was the Frank Worrell Trophy that was the really important trophy at the time because it did amount to sort of de facto number one status in, uh, in, in test cricket. But the fact is that the Ashes has always made money uh, and made a lot of money. And if that's something that um, uh, speaks all languages and appeals to all administrators, um, you know, there it is. Probably got time for one more question. Yes. Did the players um, resent the fact that the, the earner never came back to Australia when they won? Hmm. Uh, look, um, I know that Steve War and, and Gideon mm. made mention of the fact that, you know, when uh, th it was, it transpired that the urn was actually going to be coming to Australia. Mm. Steve, it really did touch a nerve with Steve. He, he not a nerve, it, it really touched him. Um, and he uh, would love to have been able to hold the urn up. I, I think there was actually a little bit of panic <laughs> <laughs> from people like Steve and some of the more sensible guys in the team that if we did actually get a hold of the urn, it might not make it back to the UK. Yeah. So, yeah. so that, and, and I, as, as Lightheart, I think he was actually a little bit worried about something like that. So, um, it, you can rest, rest assured, if that had ever happened, he would have been wearing gloves and he would have been uh, a, good, uh, a good distance <laughs> away from everybody else. I, I, I think once, once all of us actually were educated about, you know, the, the, the state of play and, and, and the fragile nature of, of, of the urn. And uh, there was a great, you know, deal of effort made to inform us that it wasn't a trophy either. Um, that, you know, because there's been some beautiful trophies presented to Australia during the period of time that I played and, and, and we learned to respect them. I, I wouldn't say resentment, it, it, you know, a little bit miffed just because, you know, for a long period of time there, we were, you know, I think it was 17 years. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. And we sort of thought, well, you might as well move it into the MCG or something <laughs> like that. But, you know. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much to Jed, Alice, Stuart and Taylor for uh, your insights and reflections tonight. They were worth my skipping cricket practice for. Um, <laughs> thanks to you all also for coming and for your support of our magnificent new state library, older even than the ashes, but like them, never fresher or more inspiring. Good night.